I created my own capacitor using aluminum foil and paper. Does anyone even use aluminum foil for cooking food anymore? The symbol of a capacitor reminds you how it's made. You have two conductive plates or strips or whatever. Basically a lot of surface area, not a lot of volume, separated by something. Something that does not conduct electricity. It's called a dielectric in a capacitor. You can use a vacuum, you can use air, you can use anything. Different materials have different what's called permittivity, which means they're better or worse for making a capacitor. We'll just talk about normal capacitors today, like ceramics, where it's just two materials with a dielectric. Something like an electrolytic capacitor uses fancy chemistry to create its own dielectric on the fly, which is why it's got weird properties and it's polarized. We're just gonna make the simple one. A basic homemade capacitor is three layers. In the middle, You've got whatever happens to be available, in my case, paper. Paper has a reasonable permittivity that makes an acceptable capacitor for hobby work. You're not going to put a thousand volts across it, but you're also not going to put a thousand volts across it. Here we have our two conductive plates. They are aluminum foil. You can use any metal. You could use copper, whatever. But aluminum foil is cheap and easy, and it's already nice and flat. Now, this is the minimum, and you, you have little tabs. I'll show you in a minute, but you have little tabs out as uh, electrodes, contact points. So you just leave a little bit sticking out, but I'll show you. Now, I'm actually going to add two more layers just to make life easy. Two more layers of paper. You don't need these for a capacitor, but this way you can put it down on the table, you can put something metal on it, you don't have to worry about it shorting every five seconds, you don't have to worry about ripping it either. You got the, the paper is just the outer protective layer. Also, if you really wanted to, this allows you to fold it, and it would still work just the same. So, paper, foil, paper, foil, paper. And what I was saying about those tabs, you just have your piece of foil look like this. A rectangle, but it's got a little bit at the end sticking out, because you're going to want to have the middle part in between the layers of paper. So this just allows you to put your alligator clip on. Otherwise, that's it. You just make a sandwich. Now, one thing that I discovered is I like to attach aluminum foil to paper using you know, glue sticks. It's just the regular craft glue sticks you use to stick paper to paper. And that's how I did the aluminum foil circuit board. So I glued the aluminum foil to both sides of the dielectric paper and then glued down the protective layers of paper and my capacitor didn't work. As it turns out, the glue actually made, it, it, it's not conductive. The glue is not conductive. It didn't short anything. But what happened is the idea of the dielectric is it's supposed to block current flow. It's supposed to be an insulator, but the closer you get it together, the, the, the thinner the separation, the better. So you want to walk the razor's edge of just barely not letting current through. And that's what permittivity is. So you want to have a material that is a really, 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 really good insulator as thin as possible. Because if you put voltage across something that doesn't block it very well, something that's not a great insulator, it'll break down and it will start conducting across the middle plate, across the dielectric, the middle layer. And that's what happened when I glued it. Apparently the glue is not a very good insulator. So when I added the glue, the voltage was just zipping right across my capacitor unless I used an extremely small voltage. So I pulled off the paper and the glue came with it and I added new paper and now it works fine. So don't glue it. <laughs> The instructions on the internet for this usually show people taping the edges. Now I know why. So how do I know how big my capacitor is? What's the capacitance? There's a formula. Roughly, the capacitance equals the dielectric permittivity of the material times the permittivity of air times the area over the distance. Epsilon zero is just a magic number. It's in terms of pi, but it's roughly 8.84 times 10 to the negative 12. I'm going to ignore units. We're just going to get farads out of this. So basically, it's just that constant. The dielectric constant is what your material is. For paper, it's about 2.5. Different paper is going to have different ones, but 2.5 is a good estimate. This you just look up because scientists have done experiments to figure out what it is. So it's just another constant, except this one is always the same, and this one is what are you using for your dielectric. And then area and distance are the easy ones. Area is square meters of the capacitor. And the simple formula works for just a capacitor that's two plates and nothing else. So it's just, it's just take the area, convert it to square meters, and distance is how far apart. Basically, how thick 
your dielectric is. So that's going to be obviously in meters. So you look up the dielectric constant for your dielectric, you plug in this number, you give the area of your capacitor and the thickness of the dielectric. And I looked it up, the average piece of paper, just normal paper, is a tenth of a millimeter thick. So I just use that figure. So the capacitor I made, I use the distance equals roughly 0.1 millimeters. The area I said was about six inches times four inches equals 24 square inches is about 0.015 square meters. And I underestimated it because it's not a perfect cut, but I figured that's a good enough number. And then of course, I used 2.5 for the paper dielectric constant. I plug it all in and I get farads. The calculation came out to be 33.15 nano farads. Spoiler, it's not. I actually underestimated the area and I underestimated the dielectric distance, which I'll demonstrate in a moment. But if you correct those, then it gets closer to the actual number, which is in the picofarad range, which is still a normal range for capacitors. I have a whole box of micro to picofarad capacitors. So anyway, that's the theory of it. You just, you just put some paper between foil, you got a capacitor and you can figure out the capacitance. So now let me go ahead and show you the capacitor in action using my oscilloscope and we can actually figure out how big this thing really is. But I suppose first I should show you my test circuit. I have my oscilloscope generating a square wave and I've created a low pass filter using a resistor and a capacitor and I'm going to use that to measure the RC time constant where R times C equals tau or in this case five times so that it charges almost fully. So I've got the square wave generator going into an NPN. This is just an inverter so it generates the square wave across the capacitor with my power supply instead of draining the power through the signal generator of the oscilloscope. And then I'm measuring here. So when the transistor is closed, you've got positive through the resistor, through the capacitor to ground, so it's an RC network. And when the transistor is open, you short the capacitor to ground and drain it almost immediately. So you'll get a curve like this, sort of a smoothed out sawtooth, like a wave or something, like an ocean wave. And I'm using very small amounts of power, so constantly shorting the capacitor and transistor are not going to do anything. It just drains super fast. So now onto the oscilloscope. So my capacitor is actually under this box over here, connected by alligator clips to the board, because I took away the glue, so it was just loose, so I just have it here to flatten it. And then my test circuit is thus. I'm using a 2N3904 transistor, bog standard, and because I have what I'm expecting to be something in the nanofarad range, I'm using a mega ohm, one mega ohm resistor for the RC network. So that brings it up into a reasonable, let's say hopefully one kilohertz range. And as you can see, I've got five volts on the power supply. My function generator is giving out a square wave, two volts peak to peak, so plus or minus one volt, which, I mean, the negative voltage isn't doing anything, so that's just silly, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Transistor's not gonna break with negative one volt, and the frequency is one kilohertz. And you can see, I have a recognizable waveform. It's charging and discharging, so I'm in the ballpark and I can work with this. So the resistor I'm using, one mega ohm, will be okay. So what I want to do now is just adjust the waveform until I can see that it's basically topping out, because I want to do five times R times C, so it's like 98, 99% charged. So I want to get a waveform where it's 98, 99% charged to the supply voltage, and then I can look at how far apart they are and I can get the charging time, which will get me the capacitance since I know the resistance is about one mega ohm. So I want to mess with this until I have my recognizable waveform. So I can see that it's not fully charging. This is not a nice full charge waveform. So I'm going to decrease the frequency, which gives it more time to charge. And as you can see, I'm getting more and more of the waveform. And then if I do it to an absurd degree, see now I'm just extending it. It's fully charged and it's just sitting there fully charged. So about here, let's say, is pretty good. Now I'd like to make it easier to see visibly. So I'm gonna move it down to about there. I'm going to increase the voltage and uh, decrease this. There we go. So I'm gonna put this on one volt separation and I'll move it down three volts, the bottom of the wave. So then I wanna put the top of the wave up at a marker too. Let me go ahead and decrease the frequency again so I can see the line easier. So I'm going to adjust the supply voltage until it's right about on the line. So at about 6.6 .6 volts, I'm getting 
the full waveform. So now we don't need to see the power supply anymore. So now what I want to do is adjust the frequency until it's basically getting to the top, but no further. I don't want it to sit there charging. Right when it gets to this line should be when it's about five times R times C fully charged. So I'm gonna move the time to the left so that I have more room to work with and I'm going to get a better view Oh, I gotta do it this way. I'm just extending how far I can see, and now I'm gonna actually decrease the frequency, and now I can make it more visible again. So I'm basically just extending my view of the time so I can see where it's flat. So somewhere right about there, I'm gonna say right in there. It's in the ballpark anyway. So now, I'm gonna shrink the view back down a bit. I'm gonna put the left side here, where it starts charging, onto the center. Then I'm going to shrink this down until the right side is on the line. So I'm at about 470 microsecond separations. So I've got about four times 470 microseconds is my charge time. So if I take 470 microseconds, multiply by four for my charge time, that should equal five times R times C. So divide by five, divide by R, which is one million ohms, and I should get capacitance, which is roughly 376 picofarads. So that's only a factor of 100 off of the 30-some nanofarads I expected, which can easily be accounted for by measurement errors in my very approximate aluminum foil capacitor. Cool beans. But here's the real test. I have actual capacitors. What do I have that's near 376 picofarads? How about a 330 picofarad? If I swap in this 330 picofarad capacitor, I should get a very similar waveform without changing any settings. Let's try it. Now, would you look at that? No settings changed at all, and it's only slightly wider. Looks like I was right on the money. So let me go ahead and swap it back, and there's my original again. There's one more fun little thing I can do, and I want to do it right now before I take the capacitor out from under this box. Because remember it's under this box to flatten it out? This box is just my capacitors. It's not very heavy. Remember how part of the capacitance calculation is the thickness of the dielectric? Watch this if I just press this box and squeeze down on the capacitor. And down and up and down and up and down and up. And if I squeeze on this box, I'm actually pushing the foil and dielectric down. Paper's a little squishy. The foil might be a little, you know, crinkly. And I'm making the dielectric thinner. I'm reducing the distance between the plates without changing the permittivity. I'm removing some air, a teeny tiny bit, but mostly it's not air, mostly it's paper. So I'm really not changing the permittivity noticeably at all, but I am shrinking the width of the dielectric. And when I press down, you'll see that the curve goes down. The reason for that is it's taking longer to charge because it has more capacitance. When I let up, it gets further away, reducing the capacitance. Isn't that neat? There's your practical world demonstration. So obviously, if you're making one for yourself, find some way to make it as flat as possible. Squeeze it down, but don't use glue. So the final thing is I'm just going to show you the capacitor. So like I said, I had removed the glue, so it's just loose sheets right now. But this is my capacitor. I've got a sheet that's paper on one side and tin foil on the other, aluminum foil. Same thing here. Oh, and look at my oscilloscope go crazy. You can see it. And then I have a sheet of paper in the middle, and I was pressing them down. But look, see? Every time I put them together, I'm making a capacitor. I take them apart, and it's, you know, just it's just reading the, the waveform in the air, electromagnetic waves. But... If I put it back down on the table, nice and neat, how it was, aligned with each other, put the box back on and push it down a little bit, boom, there's our capacitor back. Isn't that amazing? And it's just two little alligator clips. What happens if I fold it? With the dielectric in there, see? You can fold it, you can crumple it, you can, you can straight up crumple it all you want. And right now, you know, squeeze it down so it's nice and close together, and I've basically got the same one. This is how you can make a smaller capacitor. You basically make your, make your capacitor and you roll it up, almost into a cylindrical shape. That'd be pretty handy for putting on a board, wouldn't it? Of course, if you're gonna put it on a board, just buy a capacitor. Fun and learning, that's why we do things around here. It doesn't have to be practical. It doesn't have to be useful. I have had some unpleasant comments left on my videos to the nature of, why would you do this? This is stupid. Sure, 
A lot of the things I do are stupid. This is a diary of my learning. You're learning along with me. For the calculus, I already knew that. But for the electronics, this is both our journey. So if you like it, stick around. And if you don't, there's plenty of other channels with lots of smarter people than me. I recommend SciShow or whatever learning channel your favorite YouTubers have been sponsored by recently. In any case, I'll be seeing you.